I pieced together one hour of some of my very best Apex content. Now, some of you may have seen some of this before, but others of you will be seeing this for the very first time. Regardless which one you are, if you want to get better at Apex in every way, then this is the video for you. There are timestamps in the video, so let's get into it. These are five tips to avoid taking damage in Apex Legends. If you apply them, I promise you, you're going to see instant results in your gameplay. So let's get into it. Tip number one. Try to never allow yourself to be open up to multiple enemies at once. This is obviously an ideal situation, but of course there will be times where it's just not possible or you misread the situation and boom, two guys are shooting at you. However, it's what you want to strive for each and every fight. Now, every fight I go into, I'm assessing what part of the map is it on? What specific terrain is best to be in? And where do I believe all three of my opponents are? Great players will enter fights on a slower approach until they feel like they have this figured out. Now, once they know where everyone's at, that's when they strike. Having more than one person shooting at you at the same time will not only make you take significant damage, but it's also just going to kill you much quicker. A lot of players tend to develop a tunnel vision on just one enemy. And while yes, at times this can be helpful because certain players will need your sole focus, you still always have to think about fights in multiple waves. Very rarely is it just a solo that you're taking a fight against. And so many times I will hear players say to me, well, I get one player really low and I go to push them, but I always die to their teammates in some different angle or area. And this is because players are not actually considering where the other two enemies are when they go to push. So if you're dying like this a lot, you need to spend more time assessing before pushing up into stuff you don't know too much about. And this is what I mean by multiple waves. Dying to kill one enemy is not what you want to strive for. Sure, it's not the worst case scenario because it's a trade at the end of the day, but you're you're still leaving your teammates in a 2v2 and if you're solo queuing well we all know how that could go with random teammates if in your next fight you assess one guy on the far left but two are spread out on the right and you realize you can get to that guy on the left while simultaneously blocking the other two's line of sight by taking a specific route then of course this is what you want to be doing but no matter how good you are it's always extremely difficult to take out more than one enemy at once so keep this in mind if you enjoyed the first tip and you're not already subbed please go ahead and subscribe so that you can learn more about improving at apex and it would mean a lot to me if you hit it tip number two the 50 50 rule this is a really important tip that i've mentioned in some previous vids but the concept is simple when initiating contact with an enemy team you want a portion of your screen covered with cover 50 percent of your screen utilizing cover is a solid spot to be in but it doesn't always have to be 50 percent. sometimes it could be like 80 percent if you're abusing a head glitch or other times it could be as low as just 20 percent if the only cover near you is some small raw or tree. The idea behind all of this is if you're utilizing some cover, not only are you in theory a harder target to hit, but you also have some flexibility when it comes to using heals or reloading during the fight or even repositioning so you don't have to take tons of unnecessary damage. Now I'll get into some of that stuff later in the video, but I want to mention how some people have misinterpreted this tip in the past, so let me clarify a couple things. First is, you really don't need to abuse cover like this if you clearly have the better of the damage blows in a 1v1 fight. Let's say I take 20 damage, but I deal 100. Well, I'm going to give up my cover if it means I need to push that guy and secure the kill sooner. I don't want to sit behind my cover while that player goes and presumably heals up. And then the second thing is if you can secure the knock while still remaining behind or near that cover, then of course this is what you want to strive for, especially if that player still has remaining teammates. And this is often most common when players have high ground. They feel the need to give it up and drop on the player to get closer to them when they could still just stay on high ground and beam the player while they're stuck on low ground. Remember, high ground is leverage in a fight and you don't want to give it up until you absolutely have to or need to. Tip number three, use your abilities and movement to become evasive from potential damage. Most abilities in Apex can be used in both offensive and defensive manners and this is partially what makes Apex, well, Apex. Movement abilities are pretty straightforward when it comes to this concept, but saving your tactical or ultimate to escape a dicey situation is definitely a solid move, especially if you're the only legend on the team with any sort of mobility. But with that said, everything in Apex has a risk reward. You can't just expect to shoot a Pathfinder zipline in front of your enemies and make it out scot-free, just the same way you can expect an Ash portal will be completely safe if your enemy has you low and could just follow you through to the other side. As I like to tell players, 
hours. Apex is a game of seconds. So if getting out to some safety for five seconds just so you can pop a battery is all you need, then that's what you want to be facilitating. Space away from your enemies should equal time. And time to heal is really important when it comes to resetting in fights. You can also use abilities like Newcastle's Wall, Gibby's Bubble, Caustic Traps, Fuse's Ult, on and on to avoid taking damage by zoning off enemies or creating cover on the fly. Now, I won't get into each and every single ability here, but I think you get the point. Most legends have something they can do to either prevent damage or at the very least stall the fight so that you can have an opportunity to heal and do whatever else. Now, movement on the other hand is something much more tangible to be using during fights. Most mobility, in fact, I think all of it, if you take out abilities, doesn't have a cooldown. And I would go as far to say that movement's core utility in Apex is so that you'll take less damage during fights. Using mechanics such as a left to right strafe, crouching, slide jumping, and quickly interacting with zip lines is what will be most commonly used during a lot of your fights. These are pillars of movement in my opinion, and if you combine them with everything else I discuss in this video, then you will be well on your way to becoming cracked at this game. Tip number four, always reload behind some bit of cover before you re-peek. If you're not doing this, it's where a lot of unnecessary damage can and will occur. If you watch your favorite content creators carefully, they will almost never reload in front of their enemies. They do this because they know it's just a free way for the opponent to get the better of them in the fight. Doors, walls, rocks, high ground, any sort of cover you are using or just close to is where you want to gravitate to if you need to reload. Now the good news is, if you learn to do this, you can and should couple it with healing as as well. Great players will do the same thing but with healing. They never will heal in the open because they also know it's just asking to die. Now of course a lot of you guys watching this aren't healing in the wide open thinking oh my enemies won't do anything about it. But I will say that these habits in tip number four will help you become more mindful of your surroundings each fight. In this way you will sort of always be assessing your available cover and that's what I really want you to take away from this point. Remember the time it takes to kill in Apex heavily coincides with the time it takes to heal. It's really important to understand both of these variables when gauging who to fight in Apex and why. I also want to say on the topic of healing, I recommend to nearly always be healing if you take any damage. Any significant damage, that is. But especially if you're doing so while solo queuing. You never want to think your random teammates are thinking what you are or that they're going to do the right thing. So take care of yourself first, and the way you do that is by never going in lower than you need to be in any given fight. Sometimes, and this will occur less often, but if the situation calls for it, you can cancel a heal if it means you're doing it so that you can help your teammate 2v1 your opponent. Or if the enemy is very low and is going to thirst your teammate and get their armor swap, then yes, in those moments I would probably cancel the heal and try to take them out before they could do that. Tip number five, facilitate the fights you want contingent off of your loadout. Look, this may seem like an obvious one, but I promise you guys I wouldn't be mentioning any of these tips I have if I didn't still see them day in and day out in my games. If you're running a loadout of let's say a bolt and a peacekeeper, then you are obviously using a pretty close range setup in nature. So you should not be entertaining fights that are anything beyond 40 to 50 meters. You should be solely focused on closing the gap to your enemies. And if you are being engaged by a team with snipers or marksman rifles, you either need to break their line of sight and leave the fight entirely or get much closer to them while avoiding taking damage from them on the approach. I always tell players I coach, don't play into your opponent's hand like that. Look at what they have and how they would want to fight you and try to do the opposite. Now, if you're the one on the other side using the long range weapons, you should always pair it with something close range so that you're not completely neutralized when the enemy gets close to you. But you should be facilitating more space between you and your opponent with your long range weapons. Look for good angles that favor that type of playstyle and really take advantage of that positioning over your opponent. At a certain point in Apex, players reach a high enough skill ceiling where they can deal damage to anybody in their lobby. But Apex is a balance of dealing damage while simultaneously not taking a ton of it. This is is where the skill gap will play a huge role in your games. Having good movement on controller in Apex is not super easy to do. But luckily for you, in this video I'm teaching everything you'll need to know about it. And yes, all of these things will apply to console and PC players. So let's get into it. The first movement techniques I want to go over are going to be the ones used on zip lines. Now everybody loves zip lines and the sick movement that you can create from them. A lot of creators have learned to embellish these movement techniques and it looks really cool for them to pull off. So let me show you how to have better movement while utilizing zip lines. The first movement tech is what I call the quick interaction. This is where you'll be able to interact with the zip and create momentum from side to side or up above you. This makes it so that you don't actually have to ride the zip line and become a stagnant target for your enemies. 
The way I do this is I press X for interact and then quickly press jump while simultaneously looking the opposite direction. So let's say I'm in the zipline building, I want to quickly get to the floor above me. I press X facing towards the zipline shaft and then I quickly press jump while turning my view in the opposite direction towards the floor I want to land on. This can also work on a side to side basis, but it's not as useful because as most of you know, we can only interact with the zipline three times before it'll kick us off. Now, this took me a while to learn and it is pretty awkward to do, especially if you hold the controller normally and don't use any paddles like myself. But as you can see, it's definitely possible to do and certainly will help you while you're in these buildings or really in any area with a zipline. The second zipline technique that you're going to want to learn is what's known as the zipline super jump. Instead of making a greater than symbol on the zipline, you're going up higher off of the interaction. So the move you do is more like an upside down seven. I hope that vision makes it a bit more clear, but it could just be confusing. What? Well, anyways, let me explain how to do this first, and then I'll get into like when you're going to want to do it. If you're in the zipline building, it's very similar to the quick interaction, but instead of hitting jump once, you're going to need to spam it twice and quickly. The timing of when you hit jump twice is what will make or break when you're trying to do this. This double jump is what will give you that extra boost up and you're going to need to hit X and then AA and you're going to want to turn 180 so that you're back facing whichever floor you're trying to get to or look up at. You can perform this tech on nearly all zip lines. So map made horizontal zip lines, pathfinder made horizontal ones, zip lines that aren't in an elevator shaft, which may send your momentum further out horizontally, but you can do this on basically any zip line. The technique is pretty useful to learn as your opponents aren't really going to know what the heck you're doing unless the player is very experienced, but it's just going to be hard for them to track you in general. If you're in any building that has a zip line and you want to peek the floor above you without necessarily committing on going up to that floor, this is a very OP tech that you'll see your favorite content creators use. This works even better if you have a single fire gun too, because you'll briefly have a moment to shoot anyone who is on that floor above you. If you can get some good damage off, then you can just commit on going up onto that floor as the zip line will still be right next to you so that if you get that damage, you can reattach and interact with the zip and then follow onto that floor. However, another use case though, is if you're trying to escape or quickly get to the top floor, you can super jump and then get onto whichever floor it is, quickly turn around, see if the enemy chases you, and if they do, you may be able to one clip them as they ride the zip line. But if they have good movement because, well, they've watched this video too, then it will be difficult for you to track them most likely, but at least you'll have high ground over them. So I just covered some of the more advanced techniques to be using on zip lines, but I have to talk about why movement is important in the first place. Movement should be used so that you can become evasive ultimately make yourself a harder target to hit and to make yourself less predictable to your enemies and this can work on either the offensive or defensive end of things but ultimately movement needs to complement the rest of your gameplay there are no great players who are just great because of their movement they're also utilizing map awareness good aim game sense a firm understanding of legends abilities and much more I often see so many newer players develop misconceptions on how movement should be used in their own games. Movement will not kill your enemies, but it can assist with you dying less and getting more kills if you learn to polish up the other areas of your gameplay. Next, I want to talk about slide jumping. Now, this is one of the most basic movement techniques in Apex, and most of you watching this will already know how to do it. However, there are plenty of you who are not utilizing it enough or at the right times. This technique is what you'll be using most often as a controller player. And while it is not advanced, all you have to do is slide forward after you've already got some momentum while running and then press jump towards the end of the slide. Now, as controller players, we wanna be facilitating close range fights and slide jumping in to get closer to our enemies is a solid strategy, especially if you're doing it to close the gap even closer while they're behind some cover and you already know they've taken damage. By doing this, you will get to them sooner rather than just by running at them. And on the flip side, it will probably throw them off guard a little bit because their aim may not catch up to you if you're using a technique that they weren't anticipating like you just running at them. There will also be a tad bit less audio on yourself because you're not having any footstep sounds as you're getting closer. The conclusion in this is that you don't just want to slide jump around the map. You want to be slide jumping in fights. You may need to do it to get around the corner so that you can pop a bat. You may need to do it so that you can get closer because you have a peacekeeper and at 10 feet it's not as good as at having it at 5 feet. Whatever the case is, use it more in fights. 
Now, a very similar technique to slide jumping is what I call jump sliding. Same concept here, except we're jumping first and sliding second. When can we use this move? Well, there's a few options. Jumping and then sliding into momentum on a downslope or anything that will create momentum down, you could use to create some space away from your opponent. Or you could use it on the opposite side to create momentum to close the gap to them. The cool thing with this technique is it's easy to do and it's pretty widely applicable. It doesn't have to be a great big hill that you jump slide into. It could just be a box or a flat rock or really any small piece of architecture that you climb up, jump, and then slide forward closer to your enemy. Sometimes I will do this mid fight. Let's say I'm on a roof, but I don't like the damage trade off that's going on. So I'm moving off the roof while still firing at my enemy. If the roof has any architecture that will stop me from just walking off, I can jump, crouch midair, and create a slide off of the roof while never turning my back on the enemy. And this is a really solid way to get out of a fight without letting your guard down. It's something you have to be really conscious of. You have to be paying attention to your health bar and hopefully the enemy isn't killing you too quick. But if you're mindful enough, you can be utilizing this technique way more often than I'm sure most of you are. The next technique I want to go over is wall bouncing. This is one of the most useful advanced movement techniques in the game. So first, let me explain how to do this consistently, and then I'll get into the use cases for it. So what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to go at a wall, box, or any other piece of architecture that has some height to it. You're going to go at an angle. And in the beginning, it's easier if you start at more of a diagonal angle. And then when you improve at doing this, you can go more parallel to the wall. You're going to slide jump at it. The slide needs to be timed correctly and at the right distance away from the wall. Coming out of the jump after you slide, you'll be heading towards the wall. So I turn my stick inward toward whichever side it is on, and then I press jump again right when I connect to the wall. Then coming off of that jump, you should get a lot of momentum. What you want to do is turn the opposite way away from the wall. It doesn't have to be a complete 180 that you do, but most of the time it'll be about turning 90 degrees or so. Now it will take some practice to do this if you can't already do so, but give yourself some time in learning it. Once you feel like you've got it down pretty consistently, it's mandatory that you start doing it all over the map in the games you're playing. Look at every game you play as practice for using this technique. Eventually, this will help train your mind into remembering to do this during an engagement. If you never implement it in the downtime throughout your games to begin with, you will never remember to do it when it matters. I constantly talk to players who are like, yeah, I know how to do it, but I just never do it in game. And what I just explained is 100% the solution to this. Be mindful of the fact though that different legends have different hitboxes so their heights will vary and this can affect certain wall bounces. Taller legends like Pathfinder may not be able to wall bounce from the same distance on a box or a wall as Wraith or Lifeline can because Apex thinks Pathfinder is trying to mantle or climb up the box. Wraith and Lifeline are obviously much smaller legends so you must time the slide at the right distance and this will vary slightly on each legend and each object you're trying to bounce off of. So when should you be implementing this into fights? Well, I think there's really two or three use cases. First is to be evasive and take less damage as you try to reposition away from your opponent. Second is to break line of sight and surprise your opponents on a more aggressive approach. And third is just to be flashy. If you're using it to be evasive or to break line of sight, then it's a defensive tactic and should be used as a means to reposition and hopefully take less damage in doing so. It won't always work, but obviously nothing in Apex does. If you're using it on the offensive end to surprise your opponents, and also break line of sight, then be ready to shoot as soon as they are in your field of view. The wall bounce is a quick technique, and as soon as you land, that surprise factor is essentially over. So capitalizing on that brief moment where the enemy doesn't know what you're doing is critical to play off of. This mechanic is a great way to output some serious damage while at the same time avoiding damage from your enemy. Apex can often be a game of seconds, so if you wall bounce and avoid the first few shots from your enemy while you strike a quick blow to them, that could be all of the advantage you need to win that 1v1. I would also consider utilizing this if you are in a disadvantaged fight when you have to take on multiple opponents, but maybe you won't have space and time to heal after you fight the first enemy. If you can implement something like this to take less damage, you could increase your chances of winning a 1v2 or even a 1v3. The last aspect to wall bouncing is using it in a downslope to create more momentum. Really pay attention to where you're wall bouncing off of because you may just land in a slide and that could be helpful to get away further from your enemy or even close the gap to them. Players who have really good movement are really aware of the map. They know the intricacies of buildings or layouts of specific areas and this will go a long way in increasing your movement in Apex. I really don't want this fact to be underestimated. Map awareness is so key when it comes to your movement in Apex.
There are five keys to improving your aim in Apex. Now the last one I'll cover is the most important one, but it won't mean much if you don't understand the first four. So let's begin. Key number one, follow your target and not your crosshair. This is the most important tip to learn when it comes to aiming, especially in a shooter game that has a long time to kill and where movement plays a pretty significant role. Aiming in any FPS video game is what they call a fine motor skill, similar to playing an instrument, drawing, or just using a keyboard. In order for people to be skilled at things like this, they need to have good hand-eye coordination. Now, this whole concept could deserve an entire video, but the points you're going to want to take away are by following your target instead of your crosshair, well, hand-eye coordination will do its thing here. Naturally, you will be connecting with your target as long as your eyes are watching where they're actively going. This can be taken a step further when you become experienced in Apex and learn to anticipate the direction in which your opponent is going. You'll know what's a realistic move for them to achieve, whether that's a wide strafe to left or right, or the use of an ability that will make their movement more unpredictable. Now, one tip to make this whole thing easier is try to keep your cursor in the center of your screen nearly at all times. There's a concept called screen centering, which basically means if your cursor is in the center of your screen, it's much easier to track enemies and you'll be properly set up to initiate damage when you come across someone. Aiming center mass will result in a ton of body shots, but probably will kick up and hit some headshots too, which do have a higher damage multiplier on them, so you should wind up efficiently knocking your enemies. If you're looking too much to the left or the right or up or down, this will significantly throw off your aim as you're going to be approaching or coming across new targets. Screen centering is why the cursor is naturally set in the center of our screens. But if we tend to drift to the left or the right, whether it's because our controller is faulty or because we're not paying attention, this can add in a layer of just making us not as proficient with our aim. The next key is all about the hip fire changes and how you want to adapt to them. So now that Apex has significantly changed up how accurate hip firing is with automatic weapons, it's important to understand when hip firing is applicable and when it will be ineffective. The newest update in Season 16 hit assault rifles even further than they did back in Season 14. So with that said, using a weapon like the R301 and expecting it to be the ultimate S tier weapon up close, mid range, and at moderate long range distances is just no longer realistic. So now with ARs, I really only hip fire if I'm within 5 meters or less to my enemy. I want them to be taking up a larger part of my screen because the hip fire bullet spread is very wide now. The closer I am to the target, the more likely this wider spread will connect to them. The further back they are from me, like 7 to 15 meters, the less chance I have at connecting on shots. Now, when it comes to SMGs, you might be able to get away with hip firing in that range because if you have a purple laser sight, your weapon will have some of the most accurate hip fire that we can get nowadays in Apex. But if it's a fast shooting weapon like the R99 or the car, even though the car doesn't take laser sights, hip firing from that 7 to 10 plus meter range might not be as good if you don't have clear shots. What I mean by this is because the gun shoots so fast, it's that much more important to not miss crucial shot opportunities when it's going to matter most. And typically up close is where bullets matter the most. For anyone who is unaware, the reasons to hip fire are generally to have the ability to complement the spray with a faster stray speed, but in a trade off for a wider bullet spread. However, when we ADS, aim down our sights, we get a tighter, more accurate bullet spread, but in a trade-off for a slower strafe speed. The problem is the wider bullet spread we get when hip firing now is wider than it's ever been before, and this wasn't really altered for the SMGs or ARs up until season 14. So that was a few years of Apex being fairly predictable and hadn't really changed the mark in this regard. Weapons that were in the LMG class and the Marksman class have had their hip fires significantly diminished over time, and I think that's because the Apex devs started to realize the player base was taking advantage of hip firing in moments where maybe they felt like the player shouldn't be able to get away with it. Now, I don't know if this removes the skill gap or incorporates a new one, but all I know is that it's changed. And so if you want to be able to survive with these changes, it's important to learn when it's going to be applicable and when it's not. Let's move on to key number three. Now on the topic of strafing, I'm going to discuss best practices with it and recoil smoothing, but I'll get into that in just a moment. 
Although strafing is more of a movement mechanic, the reason I'm discussing it during this aim guide video is because in Apex, moving while shooting is something that is very common and needs to be utilized. On a basic level, strafing is just moving left or right. Now, when it comes to improving your strafe, well, you want to keep in mind what weapon you have and where you are on the map. See, if you're hyper aware of your surroundings, strafing in and out behind cover or around it can be a very smart play and often should be done. Now, if you're following the first key I discussed about following your target and not your crosshair, well, you can coordinate a strafe that either mirrors your opponent, meaning y'all are moving in the same direction as one another, or you can use an opposite strafe, where you'd move left and they would move to their left, which is your right. There isn't a one-size-fits-all approach here, but you do want to get in the habit of moving side to side, but not overdoing it while you're firing. Sometimes, it may not even be necessary to overcomplicate an engagement by strafing. That is, if you know the enemy is already very weak, and or you're just really close to knocking them. Sometimes just standing still and focusing on hitting those few remaining shots is the job that needs to be done. Now you can also add in some crouches while you strafe. This is something that will improve your movement and make you a harder target to hit. However, if you overdo this, well, expect for it to not have the same outcome and for it to just mess up your aim. Now, I mentioned recoil smoothing, so what is it and how can you use it? Well, it's a feature in Apex where if you move left or right while firing, you will severely minimize or in some instances flat out remove horizontal recoil. It works within a 60-ish meter range and obviously it will work the best as you get closer to your target, but there are so many misconceptions about this. One of which is that you don't need to know the recoil patterns of the weapons that you're using. And the other is that you don't have to pull down on your stick or your mouse to try and control the recoil at all. I believe these both to be false. I still recommend learning the recoil patterns of all the weapons, if not for the fact that you won't always be recoil smoothing, but it'll also just make doing this easier. And second, you will still need to pull down on your stick or your mouse to control the recoil somewhat. And by learning the recoil pattern, well, this will just become that much easier. For example, I cannot just strafe left or right while shooting a car without my right thumb stick being controlled at all. The gun will still kick up, and it will not have the recoil smoothing effect that I'm looking for. But by subtly pressing down on the right stick, and by moving left or right or both while firing, I can achieve recoil smoothing. Now, this does work on both inputs, just so everyone's aware, so whether you're on mouse and keyboard or controller, the same stuff applies. The fourth key to improving your aim is having a solid warm-up routine. Now that the firing range is finally updated, it's more important now than ever to get a solid warm-up in before hopping into some games. I don't care how experienced you are or how new you are. This strategy works for every single player I've ever coached, and it's something that I stand behind 100% myself. Now let's get into the last key, number five. Missing shots in Apex is normal. In fact, it's normal in every first-person shooter. Every player, and I mean literally every player, suffers from this at one time or another. When we miss shots, we can stress ourselves out, which can cause tension. When we tense up, it will have a further negative effect on our aim. This is what you want to try to avoid in any fine motor skill, as it can completely block you off from the task at hand. A common problem when it comes to missing shots is just panicking further and then spiraling down in life time. See, in Apex, because the time to kill is so long, fights aren't always defined by who hit the first blow. Oftentimes, the fight will ebb and flow, so to speak. In and out, damage will be dealt, players will be backing up, a teammate will come in, maybe play off that damage. You get the idea. So training your mind and your hands to not quickly spiral off initially missing shots will go a long way in this game. Now, another problem that somebody brought up on my last aim video is what I would describe as panic firing. This player says, I often find myself panicking and holding down the fire button even when I know I'm nowhere near hitting the enemy. This happens more on full auto weapons like SMGs. So if you're having a hard time breaking this habit, take some slow rate fire weapons like the Peacekeeper or Wingman where it's really punishing if you miss your shots. This will get you to slow down and make sure your shot will connect. And while I agree with their point about practicing with slower fire rate weapons or straight up single fire weapons, I want to add in something more because we don't always want to shy away from automatic weapons because of this user error. Part of this problem I believe stems from not being used to fighting a lot. If somebody is panic firing, I would guess they do not have a lot of time in the game or a lot of time fighting in that range 
with that specific weapon. So practicing team deathmatch or other game modes that will be available in the mixtape playlist will go a long way here. Basically, you want to get more reps in. Now, I'm not trying to oversimplify this problem, but Apex is a punishing game, meaning if you keep making the same mistake, there will be another player out there to make you pay for it. By getting in the same or similar situations while focusing on doing the opposite of the mistake that we're making, well, over time, I believe you will start to see positive results. It's actually been my experience, not only with myself, but with my coaching too. Apex Legends can be a complex game. So in this video, I'm going to break down several fights in diamond ranks so that you guys can better understand how to improve your IQ as you go about climbing the ranks. Now, all of the info that I share in this video will translate to all of the other ranks. So if you're not in diamond yet, don't worry, this will all still apply. Let's dive into it. Now, the first type of fight I want to break down is the one where one of your teammate dies right away and it forces you and the other remaining teammate to play more on your heels. Now these moments can be extremely difficult to navigate because as you begin fighting better players, well, the less breathing room they will allow for a duo to beat them when they still have three on their team. They're going to play tighter, they're going to play more aggressive, it's going to be much harder to split them up, but I want to take a closer look at this fight right here. One thing I've preached about in previous videos is when one person goes down on your team, it's imperative that you and the remaining teammate play really close together. You have to have insane coordination. You really want to be on top of one another and communicating extremely well because the margin for error for you two is now basically nothing. So as you can see, I quickly asked my teammate to retreat back to me so that we could play in this three-story building. I knew that if we got here, this is a great way to potentially confuse this enemy team and perhaps allow for them to come in at different angles and be split up. And that's exactly what happened. I find this seer being overly aggressive and it seemed like he was waiting for his teammates. I was able to 1v1 him and then I quickly reposition because I'm anticipating the third or the second teammate to follow up right around where seer died. But as you'll notice, I run into the stairwell and I do find Loba. Now, I take both of them out and my teammate was very surprised I was able to kill both of them that quickly. So I said to him, can you handle the last one? And that's why I go ahead and pop a battery inside because at the very least, if my teammate loses this 1v1, I'm very close and I'll be fully healed to come in and clean it up. I'm playing extremely safe, but smart. In the next fight, something very similar happens again. This is the same game. We have rotated ahead. I'm keeping in mind the zone and the time and how much we have left before we got to move but there is a team that is approaching and quickly one of my teammates gets knocked. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna try to shoot one as they cross. I'm pretty ineffective at that. So I use my Bangalore ult and I call for my teammate to try to crawl back inside. As this guy walks up the stairs, he's gonna get slowed to his teammate's own fusel. I have to take advantage of that and down him. Then I realized my other teammates in a 1v1 and he had him low, so I'm able to capitalize on that. Now, I'll be honest, I don't do the best here because I kinda, I don't know what I was thinking, but I should have just pushed this guy right here. Instead, I nade him a few times, hoping he'll come out, but instead the downed guy crawls in, so now he's playing on both of their knockdown shields. I advise my teammate to crawl closer to me so that I can play off his knockdown, and potentially even beta res so he'll jump out. I wasn't sure he was in the corner here, but I'm able to take care of him, and I used my positioning as a head glitch to punish his positioning. Now, similar to the first clip, when you're down on numbers against a team, you really want to look at picking off one of the enemy players who is pushed up a little too far ahead of the rest of them. That's what I found Loba doing, and I noticed a circumstance that wasn't in her favor, and that was the fusel, which is going to slow her and obstruct some of her vision. I really had to take advantage of downing her there. Another thing is the use of my Bangalore ult. It not only dealt 40 damage to the guy my other teammate was 1v1ing, but it slowed and stunned him and I reacted quickly and I was able to take care of him. So it left me in a 1v1 and I had barely taken any damage at that point. Now, as I said, I kind of screwed up in that last 1v1. I should have been more aggressive on that Octane because he could have very well just played his two teammates knockdown shields and stayed inside that room, thirsting my downed teammate and it could have gotten messy. Instead, he pushed out, got too aggressive for no good reason, and fell into my hand. Now, once again, same game. Three versus three, top two scenario. I'm going to open this fight with some significant damage with my Kraber. This is always a great opportunity to push up and close the gap once you deal a significant amount of damage. 
You'll see I take some damage in the cross, so I'm gonna elect to heal right beneath this team, hoping my other two teammates can play off any previous damage I dealt. However, the horizon challenges me here, and I don't really like this angle. So I'm gonna briefly climb up, deal some more damage, and fall back down. Then I will look to capitalize on knocking one of them. Watson is also cracked here, so I'm trying to make sure she doesn't reset the fight. I use my last battery on the approach. So as I'm trying to sweat the down horizon, I realize I just have to push and take out the Watson. Now I kind of sacrifice myself, but I do so with the hopes that my teammate can win this 1v1. I noticed he was fully healed before I approached the Watson. So I figured it's better to take out the Watson than allow for her to potentially reset. And I don't have any big heals, so it would complicate the fight. This is definitely what I would describe as a high risk play because as you saw in previous fights, I made it a big deal to preserve my life. However, a lot of situations in Apex have a ton of nuance to them. I realized I couldn't just heal and get back in. Slow healing in this fight wouldn't have really been an option. I was also calming to my teammates, can he kill this Watson or can he at least take care of the Bloodhound while I go and try to take out the Watson. He was not really feeling like he was able to do those things, so I felt, okay, I have to take advantage of this, I have to take out the Watson, and maybe I stay alive, and maybe I get to heal then, but that's not what ended up happening. They had a long, drawn-out 1v1, and for whatever reason, this Bloodhound backed up. The Bloodhound also moved away from his down teammates as me and my other down teammate moved closer to our alive teammate. So, on top of that, he had a gold res, and that allowed for us to get a full reset, and we ended up winning the game. So what about an early sort of off drop fight? One of those fights you know somebody landed in the same POI as you and you want to look to kill them so that they don't mirror your rotation and so that you get some early KP to ease the burden of the rest of the ranked match. Well here we're going to land onto trials. We could hear gunshots going down inside of trials and we knew we wanted to fight this team. I'm going to pop my Bloodhound ult here shortly, and we are going to look to take this fight. Now when you're dropping on a team, you really want to try to seize an opening. You want to look for some sort of advantage that you can capitalize on. And here we acknowledge one guy is stuck in the center while the other two are further back. If we drop, quickly kill him, we have an easier time taking out the duo. I down Seer, I stay alive, I tell my teammates that I'm staying alive and popping a battery, and Newcastle pushes my other teammate. I look to kill him as he punches out my teammate in the corner here. And then it's 2v1. Now we're both kind of low. I throw a couple of grenades to back this crypto off of his platform. Pop a scan, let my teammate go in first. He dies and clean it up. Preserving my life was once again a common theme here, but also strategically placing myself outside of line of sight for multiple opponents. That is something that really good players abuse in Apex. They have a good understanding of where the enemies are and where they can position themselves to not be opened up to multiple lines of gunfire. In this fight, let's analyze how to close the gap against your opponents. You can see that this enemy and I are matching head glitches. I am able to get a crack, which is some great entry damage to then close the gap, because theoretically he's gonna back up the heal and he's not gonna be able to hold that angle. And if his teammate does, well hopefully we're already underneath them. You'll see I strategically place my Cyril in this corner so that they have no way of destroying it. And as I walk up to the door, I one clip the Loba. Now let's take a close look at this door clip. You'll notice I get to the door first, so I get to control the pacing of it. She is further back from the door and she's thinking about, ah, oh, I gotta get up to it, I gotta block the door. I open the door quickly because I see that's what she's doing and I just one clip her as she's sliding down in the open. I took no damage in that trade so I'm just going to quickly reload and look to re-enter. My teammate and I kick the door and see her standing right there and I get another one clip. Alright now a common theme in ranked is third parties are going to be hectic. They're going to be there, teams are going to look to take advantage of third partying you and you're going to take advantage of third partying other teams, right? Well, in this fight, we knew a third party was coming because right after I killed Seer, I got scanned by a Bloodhound. And keeping track of the legends that were at play, well, there's obviously no Bloodhound there. So our next move is take the high ground over where we think they are. If we can control height on them, we can have a huge advantage over them. I could hear the zip line as someone was attempting to come up and we are able to shoot this guy, do a lot of damage to him and force him back to low ground. Now we've completely tilted the fight into our favor as we have leverage of positioning and leverage with damage. I know this is going to sound really obvious, but one of the keys to us winning this third party fight was us being prepared for it. 
Now, we didn't really know it was coming, but the key to it lied with none of us getting knocked in the first fight. So trying your absolute best to basically never get knocked in these higher elo lobbies is something you're gonna want to strive for. Now I know, of course, most of us don't set out to die in a fight, but there are often small and subtle things we can do throughout fights to set ourselves up for success in this regard. The preservation of your life from fight to fight will help your team out immensely and further your efforts in gaining more RP. Apex is a battle royale, so at its core, your attention must always be on the possibility of other teams getting involved in whatever you're currently engaged in. If you can implement some of the tactics that I listed in this video, well, your gameplay should definitely improve over time. If you are familiar with my channel, I'm an Apex Legends coach that has done over 1,000 coaching sessions, and I'm here to break down five secrets that pro players use and abuse. Let's begin. Starting off with number one. Now everyone always asks me to make a video on this and how to effectively do it. And although each situation will be somewhat unique, let's actually break down an example and see how pros effectively push a team that has better positioning than them. The first thing to notice in this clip is that every player begins to take a different route as they close in on this building where the enemies are at. While doing this, you're going to have to be careful so that one of you doesn't get singled out and focus fired. But if you do it right, you can all swarm the area so that it's super difficult for the enemy team that's holding that area to prevent your team's push. Now, as this team encloses the building, you'll see that Sweet takes a very high IQ angle, one that most players either don't know or wouldn't think to know of in this moment. He goes to the window, and at the same time he does this, Chaotic approaches from the balcony. And this is also all done without any communication between them. Sweet knows that if one of his teammates goes to the balcony, the enemies will be positioned in a way that he could shoot them through this window. This goes on for a little while, as Sweet stacks some serious damage against them, and then the enemy team realizes his angle and tries to counter. At the same time this happens, a new team tries to get involved. And since Sweet's team is on the outside of the building, they are going to take the brunt of this. They have to pause and rethink how they're going to do this push, or if they even want to. After regrouping and discussing that pushing this team is necessary because they need their loot and they need to eliminate their leverage in order to handle whatever's next, they once again begin to breach the building. Chaotic goes to the balcony, Daltouche walks up the staircase first, and then Sweet follows. This makes this push incredibly difficult to combat because the enemies will be caught off guard and just most likely overwhelmed. Notice how Sweet didn't walk up in the same space as Touche. He let him go first so that he could do some damage and then he could trade out with him. This makes it so that even if Touche takes damage and needs to back up, Sweet can be so close and just play off any previous damage he did. And if Touche doesn't have to back out, well, it's going to be the same outcome. They aren't going to have to struggle shooting one another in the back because the staircase is such a small, confined area. But with this coordination of taking different angles and timing it well, they are able to successfully breach and eliminate this squad despite all of their advantages. I mean, this was a Watson team holding high ground and playing in a building that was pretty good for a Watson. But unfortunately, this team just gets backed into a corner and gets overwhelmed with the multiple angles and ways in which that Sweets team attacked them from. Number two, the ability to make do with very little loot. This is often something that I try to work with players on because I believe if we can lower the bar on where they're comfortable with loot, it can make them become a better player. But probably not for the reasons you're thinking. There's really two reasons I focus on this. One is so that they focus on what they have and what they're looking for nearly at all times. Learning where they can actually find loot is a huge thing that players struggle with. Maybe not so much for advanced players, but it's something you're going to have to gain and continue to build on as you progress in Apex. And number two is so that they aren't trying to overloot in situations where fighting with what you have is totally fine as long as you realize how long that loot can theoretically last you. I mean, look, sometimes you're just going to have to fight with what you have and you just have to accept it. But there's going to be other times where you just have to keep a tab on it. OK, I've got 60 bullets and this will last me, you know, this long. And from there, then I have to have a different plan. But regardless, with these clips with Hal that we're looking at, he's essentially a minimalist with loot. There's very little time that he spends on looting. But even when he does, he just elects to grab the bare minimum from death boxes that he knows will have some stuff in it. He doesn't waste time trying to wander around this POI looking for scraps because he knows there's nothing really to be found. There were two teams that landed here and most of the loot will now be on the bodies. So when he shoots his guns on the low ammo that he does have, 
he tries to make sure that the bullets really count. He's not spraying from super far away in hopes of doing 10 damage, he's trying to finish kills. Looting is actually a skill in Apex. It takes time to master your inventory, to know what you have, to know what you need, and to know where to get it. But what you need will be kind of subjective from one player to another. But looting in and of itself is sort of boring. It's not flashy, not too many people talk about it, not in depth, and so many players just overlook it. Now, Hal is definitely an extreme example of this, and that's why I chose to talk about him regarding this topic. If you've watched him before, you know at times this can be a downfall for him in some ways. He will always under loot and miss out on grabbing things like light ammo and then yell at his teammates for them to drop him some. It's comical, but it's also important to note that most of the time when he does this, it's in competitive Apex, and this is a drastically different game mode than ranked. In ranked, Hal and his team will just about push every fight they can, but in comp, it's not like that. It's much more strategic, so the opportunities to gather loot will be scarce. If you miss an opportunity to capitalize on the loot that you do find, well, a few minutes later, that can come back to haunt you. It's what I like to call the domino effect. A decision we made previously, whether it was two minutes or five minutes ago, can come back to affect us in the present. And looting is very much so intertwined with the domino effect. So learn from this and understand that sometimes you're just going to have to fight with the 30 bullets you have in your magazine. Try to make the most of it. Don't be firing from far distances and hoping that you maybe do 10 or 20 damage. Really save those bullets and understand your circumstances. This also will apply to your shields and your health meds. Don't be putting yourself in vulnerable positions to take a ton of damage if you don't have a ton of shields or heals to get you reset and ready for when the fight does eventually come to a head up close. Number three, and this one is very, very important as you try to climb the ranks and really progress in Apex. The ability to remain flexible. But what does this even mean? No one knows what it means, but it's provocative. No, it's not. It's it gets gross. the people going. It, it means in a battle royale game, there's often going to be a lot of threats to deal with, and you need to be able to consider them at any given moment. In order to get really good at this game, you need to remain flexible and be able to turn on a dime as soon as another team tries to get involved with whatever you're trying to do. In this clip here, you'll see TSM take a fight shortly after finishing a fight, only for the same thing to repeat itself right after. This not only takes a special form of chemistry within the team to be able to deal with this, but also it takes really good awareness around what's happening to you and how you can actually deal with it. With two knocks and a third party approaching from behind, TSM doesn't even worry about the remaining solo on the first team, and all three of them elect to focus their attention on the much bigger threat emerging. They do this because it's obvious what deserves their attention in this moment, but also logically, there's no way to do anything about the solo without getting punished by the new three-man third party. To analyze this a step further, the remaining solo will most likely just run away or try to grab banners while TSM is distracted with this new team. A key factor that allowed for TSM to quickly turn their attention to this new third party was the ability to armor swap off the two kills that they previously just got. This allows for a snap of the fingers reset and it can keep your head on a swivel because it's like, okay, I had to worry about my shield bar, but now I don't. And now my attention is solely focused on this new team emerging. Now it's one thing to have this awareness and this flexibility, but it's a whole other thing to win in these hectic situations because skill is going to be a huge part of this. And this brings me on to number four, but it's probably not what you're thinking. Now, some of you guys are probably thinking the obvious. Well, these guys have some of the best aim in the entire scene. And while yes, that's true, it's just a bit too obvious. That correlation can be made by really anyone. So I just want to look at it from a different angle, one that's more nuanced and one that will also benefit players who may not be as naturally gifted with their aim. Check out this clip and tell me what you notice. Whoa. I hear somebody. Yeah, that happened, boy. yeah. I'm jumping yep. down. I got a bat. Careful, you're dropping into two of them. No, I'm not. One key forward, close. Somewhere. In the knockdown, right. in the knockdown, in the knockdown, in the knockdown. On me. Come on, you guys. Got him. In the long run. The first thing that comes to mind for me is team firing. They absolutely rolled this team. And it's all because they moved in this SWAT team-like formation and team fired every enemy they came across. This is always going to be the most oppressive thing to deal with in Apex because 
one person cannot possibly shoot two enemies at once, but two players can quickly kill one enemy. Team firing is something that is vital for progressing in Apex, but it doesn't just end there. Because in order to successfully pull this off time and time again, your awareness needs to be dialed in. If you don't know the ins and outs of every piece on the map, you're gonna wanna learn that. This is what will make team firing that much easier. Because hear me out. If you know the map and you suspect or know a player to be in a certain area, but you can instantly try to attack them from a favorable position in that area. Your teammates will automatically do the same and hopefully from different angles, and you guys will have successfully achieved team firing them when you go to attack them. See, Hal's team rolled the first team, and then quickly after, they repeat the same steps on the next team. And honestly, it makes the opposition look pretty bad, but I promise you, even if these players aren't Apex Predators or equivalent to pro players, they aren't just trash. TSM was just so quick, oppressive, and strategic that they made it look like this enemy team stood no chance. To add a little bit onto this, the team firing starts to be that much more difficult to deal with when players are really quick to execute it. And I hope you guys see it for what it actually is and not just overlooking it and go, oh yeah, it's because they're good and they're rolling a master's team. That's not it, I promise you. Moving on to the last secret, number five. Despite how you may feel about the current legend meta in Apex, one thing all pros and high level players do is take full advantage of their legends kits. They create a synergy amongst the other legends on their team and they learn how to use their abilities in the best ways and at the best times. In this clip here, TSM patiently waits for a team to come out of one of the IMC armories on Stormpoint. They maintain high ground so that when this armory opens, if executed correctly, TSM can bombard them and make it virtually impossible for this team to do anything about it. On a side note, I understand the whole risk reward thing around looting while doing something like this, but Apex makes a lot of these things really feel like huge setups. From trials on World's Edge to armories on Stormpoint, it feels way too easy to get some cheeky advantage over the team who elects to upgrade their loot. I don't know. Anyway, back to the matter at hand. As the top opens, Reps throws his Cyril down and Hal throws his gravity lift over the jump pad that could launch the team out. This then overrides that ability for them to do so, so the enemy a team has to elect to stay in. Hal then throws his black hole inside, coupled with an arc star, and tries to get some initial damage. This is all that is really needed here when you couple it with some additional gunfire to gain this huge edge on this team. From there, the rest of their gunplay and focus firing takes out this squad. In the second clip here, TSM takes this isolated 3v3 towards the end of the game. And I really like the use of abilities here. First, Hal tries to take an aggressive Q onto the roof and challenge the enemy that was just there. But when he arrives, that player already dropped back down. He then uses his ult here, but I'm not so much of a fan of this because it's going to be really hard to play off of any significant damage or distraction that the ult could do here. If Hal did get some damage here, he would then probably have to drop down and be isolated away from his other two teammates. But putting that aside for a moment, what I really like is as he drops down, him and reps take out the Valkyrie. Hal then realizes he needs to heal, but he elects to throw his Q first and then starts to pop a battery so that he can then take the Q while finishing the bat and be landing by the time it completes. This only shaves off seconds, but it allows for him to be at the scene of the crime quickly. And this way, TSM can team fire and beat these guys with strength in numbers, as it's a 2v3 when they are all together. Now this was a brilliant use of his tactical here, and I wanted to be sure to point it out. Here is one tip for every legend in Apex Season 16. Let's go. Ash. You can use Ash's portal through windows. Keep in mind this ability is very sensitive when it comes to its placement, so you're able to mess it up quite easily if you're not careful. Now using this through a window into a building works, but so does the opposite, going outside of a building through the window. You can use this if you feel like a quick reposition is needed to escape, or you can use it if you're trying to be aggressive with it. Newcastle. When you're stuck in a bad position as Newcastle, direct one of your teammates, hopefully a skirmisher, to get to better positioning and then use your ultimate to safely reach them. 
This same tip can apply if your teammate is in a bad position too, but I found this works great when you have bad positioning, like an enemy has high ground over you and you're stuck on low ground. Now his ultimate is very similar to Ash's in the way that it's also very sensitive when it comes to its placement. However, when latching to a nearby teammate, this ability seems to be much more consistent, so make sure you're utilizing this component. Loba. Now I've mentioned this in a couple previous videos, but Loba is the only real support legend that has some aspect of mobility to her kit. And as a support legend, you always want to try to be the last one killed on your team. If you find yourself in an unwinnable 1v3 or 1v2, you can bracelet out of the fight and find the nearest crafter to get your teammates banners back. Now let's say you got to the crafter, but then you got pushed. Well, if you can escape further, you can use her ultimate, the black market, to then snatch the banners from the crafter. Now I want to be clear, I'm not advocating that you run away to craft banners every time someone on your team gets knocked. But if you find yourself in a situation that doesn't seem winnable, then be sure to utilize this tip. Gibraltar. When using his bubble in buildings, this can act as two different layers at once. If you're in a zipline building, putting the bubble on the third floor will still allow you to utilize part of the bubble on the fourth floor. In this clip, I remember placing this bubble so that it could help my teammate who was above me at the same time but it was also crucial for me too. This is a smart way to use a bubble in a building fight if you find your teammate and yourself to be split up, but working towards the same goal. Vantage, now I'm just gonna say it. This season, Vantage is extremely underrated and underutilized, at least at the time of making this video. So I wanna cover a couple tips for her. One is, if you are using her tactical in an aggressive manner, then be sure to crouch while you're mid-air so that you're able to pull your weapon out faster. This will only work if you crouch midair and you don't utilize her double jump at the end. If you are using her tactical to retreat from somewhere, then using her double jump will probably be much more handy in these moments. When using Vantage's sniper, think more about a sniper's role here. Play back, watch over your teammates, communicate with them regarding what you see, and go to work with it. This ability is incredibly strong and it will continuously reward you for hitting your shots. The more shots you hit, the higher damage it will tack on, and it will also subtly highlight the enemies so that your teammates know who to focus in those moments. Caustic. Now for Caustic, let's talk about trap placement, particularly around doors. So if you want to straight up block a door, that's fine, but you must communicate it with your teammates, otherwise it could get one of them killed if they're on the roof or outside of the building and wind up trying to get into that door. You also don't want the trap placed too close up against the door as part of the trap will actually appear through the door on the other side and an enemy can activate it while avoiding most of the damage and then just be able to breach the door shortly after. If you want to make it so that an enemy will have to walk into the door but still activate the trap, well put it to the side of the door opposite to which it will swing open. That way, the door won't cover some of the trap, and also when placing a trap in front of a double door, make sure that it's placed at the exact right distance away from the door so that an enemy can't barely crack open the door and defuse the trap. Lifeline. Now despite Lifeline receiving some new buffs this season, there really isn't much different with her when it comes to any advanced tips. But with that said, most inexperienced Lifelines always screw this up. Try not to revive your teammates when they are in a compromised position, unless you as Lifeline can body block for them and provide fire against whichever enemies are trying to thirst your teammate who's getting revived. Lifeline is not a free reviving tool. Yes, it's much better than manually reviving teammates, but it's not free by any means. So be careful of rezzing in open areas and just feeding your teammates to death. Rampart. Anytime an enemy is playing behind a door, pull shield out and spray them down. Rampart's ultimate can destroy doors, and most enemies either forget about this in the moment or entirely just don't know that this can happen. This is a great way to turn the tide of a fight into your team's favor. You can also throw a wall down in front of the door to amplify that damage and give you an extra layer of support from someone trying to open that door or kick it down before you're able to get Sheila out. Bloodhound. In Season 16, Bloodhound receives some pretty significant changes. Now there's something called the White Raven, and every time you interact with the White Raven, it will add a 25% charge to your ultimate. The White Raven will lead you to the nearest team, and you will find these many times throughout your games. Once you interact with it, if you look up to your minimap, there will be red arrows that you and your teammates both can see, which will be leading in the direction of the nearest team. And if you see a white circle on your minimap that looks like the care package indicator, it's actually a location of the nearest White Raven. Walk up to it and press interact for it to lead you to the nearest enemy team. This will also activate when you use Bloodhound's ultimate, as it will actively fly in the direction of where the nearest team is. Horizon. Now that her tactical doesn't allow for accurate gunfire on it, it's important to take it and try to surprise enemies and or fall off of it while shooting. 
If enemies aren't on high ground and you're using this ability to take high ground, this can be extremely viable. But don't try to do what has worked in the past, which is ride up her Q and try to one clip someone with an R301. Now, if an enemy is on high ground and you're trying to get up there, well, this ability is much faster now, and it's not always easy to follow the target on it when you're going up against one. So be mindful of what line of sight your enemies do have on you when using her lift. And if you get beamed on it, you can always fall back down and try to retake the lift while you're popping a shield battery and riding back up it. Crypto. This season, Crypto is actually a better pick than the last few seasons. He's definitely a nuanced legend, meaning the way you do certain things with his kit can be affected by small and subtle details. However, a pretty straightforward tip for him this season is utilize his drone and tap the new survey beacons. As I'm sure most of you know, this no longer gives ring knowledge. It instead is a 30 second UAV that will reveal every remaining player on your map. Now, these are static images on the map, so if players move, it won't be a live tracking of where they go. But by using his drone to gather this info, it can be incredibly valuable and way less riskier than having any of the other recon legends manually do it. Keep in mind, you can only scan each survey beacon once. So if you're holding an area and zone, remember to strategically time when you want to reveal the UAV. Next up, Pathfinder. Pathfinder zipline now goes 60% further than any of the previous seasons. Now, if you want to use it for a huge macro rotation, Besides just shooting it to the next neighboring POI, well, you can shoot the zipline to the top of a jump tower, and you will get a giant rotation from both of these combined, as the zipline will launch you right off from the top of the jump tower. However, do keep in mind that this tactic does not work on the jump tower on Broken Moon, or the jump tower on Storm Point. Fuse. Use Fuse's tactical to move enemies out from cover or punish them when they're low and were just staying behind that cover. This ability can be fairly dynamic, but it's all about damage dealing and area denial. Don't just shoot random knuckle clusters in the rough direction of where you think enemies are. Be strategic with the placement of them and find out how much they can actually move the mark in fights. Another thing is be smart about when you elect to use your knuckle cluster while going against an enemy with their gun out. If you elect to use your knuckle cluster in too many instances, you will quickly see how having your gun out is much better in most instances. If you find yourself dying a lot while using his tactical, then you're probably doing it wrong. Mad Maggie. Maggie is a great counter against several legends, including Gibraltar, but she's not the ultimate counter to a legend like Newcastle. Let me explain. Maggie's ultimate, the Wrecking Ball, can flat out destroy a Gibby bubble, and this can be a solid strat if you want to take away whatever Gibby is using that bubble for, like using a heal or trying to revive his down teammate. However, for a legend like Newcastle, her Wrecking Ball doesn't destroy his tactical or his ultimate. But if you want to really try to hurt a Newcastle team, use her Riot Drill against his tactical or ultimate. Maggie's Drill can also work great against a Gibby bubble, but sometimes it's not always worth it because of the timing of how long the bubble's up for and how long the drill will be burning for. Valkyrie. If you're falling from height and you want to be able to pull out your weapon faster, just tap the jet so that you briefly fly right before you hit the ground. This should take away any stunning effects from falling and will allow for your weapon to be drawn out faster. Catalyst. If you're using her ultimate and you need it to cover from exactly where you're standing, then be sure to look down while you're placing it. This will emerge Catalyst in the wall and continue in the direction you're looking at. However, if you just look forward and then place the wall, well, it will start a little bit in front of you. This could make a big difference if you're trying to exactly line the wall up to a building or something similar to it. Mirage. Now technically Mirage is in the skirmisher class, but the quicker you think about him as an assault slash support legend, the better of a time you'll have with this legend. Mirage's new updated revive is pretty OP. So when going for a revive, I like to either send out a tactical while controlling it or just full on use my ultimate. Then I make sure the clones are separated from me while I go for the revive. Once I get back up, I wait to pull my gun out to take advantage of the extra time being invisible. Then I slide jump out with my weapon ready to take on whoever is near. Bangalore. Let's discuss a tip about her tactical smokes. When you want to cut off an enemy's angle on you and your team and you aren't planning on pushing them, we'll start to analyze if smoking yourself would be easier than trying to smoke that enemy team. If the enemy is super far away or you're potentially worried about multiple enemies shooting at you, then shooting smoke at yourself might be the better call. 
But if you're trying to close the gap to an enemy that is holding a certain area, smoking their biggest line of sight as you're approaching is a solid play too. Now, smoking your teammates can often wind up screwing them over. So I always make sure to communicate that I'm smoking for them because if they don't have a digi threat, they could easily become disoriented from the smoke. However, there are moments where smoking you and your team are beneficial, and I hope this made it a bit more clear for you. Wraith. If you want to use Wraith's portal for a kidnap, start the portal on some sort of high ground as you are midair, jumping off of it. Then, when you're portaling at a stationary team, time your phase right before you'll start getting shot at, and then set the portal right into an enemy where they're walking or standing. As the kidnap happens, tell your teammate on the other side that you got one, and laugh as you guys hopefully kill them. If you try to do this without the help of your teammates on the other side, there's a strong chance this whole play will backfire because the first person through the portal will now have an advantage on you when you inevitably have to come through the other side. Watson. Watson's passive allows for her to carry two ultimate accelerants in one backpack slot. So make sure to always be carrying these so that you can place your ultimate down frequently throughout a match. Basically, if you're taking a fight and you're going to be playing around a certain area, look for cover to place your gen behind. If somehow it gets destroyed by using one ultimate accelerant, you will get another gen back instantly. Be sure to take advantage of this throughout your matches. Octane. When it comes to playing Octane, I often think about that one office quote with Dwight Schrute where he says, Whenever I'm about to do something, I think, would an idiot do that? And if they would, I do not do that thing. I think this perfectly summarizes what not to do on Octane. If you made it till the end, thank you so much for watching. And if you want to learn about two mistakes for every legend, well, I covered it all in this video here. Be sure to check it out next. Peace.